Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining me here today. I am with, I have the honor to be with and the privilege to be with the CEO and co-founder of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I've been a, a big fan of your content for quite some time. That's, it's, it's insane you say that. It's I, I can't even believe you're saying that. But I've been a fan of your company and your product. It's funny. You've been a fan of my content. I've been covering the company for the past five months. I've been a fan of your product for the past five years. I got access to Robinhood in 2019. I was in the back of business class. I wasn't really paying attention to what the professor was saying. I was on a website, a dinky little website called Robinhood.com. <laughs> And for the first time, I bought, I think, 100 shares of a $4 stock. And in that moment, I, you know, it's going to sound cheesy, but it was one of the most monumental moments of my life because it taught me about equity, taught me about ownership. It taught me about like, wait a second, now I have to care about this company. They have a CEO, they have earnings calls. I have to listen to these guys. And it happened because of your product. When I say something like that, and I know that experience is universalized for millions of people, how does that make you feel that your product introduced me to the markets? It, it brings me a lot of joy. And a big part of it is because that kind of mirrors my own experience. So I became interested in investing um, when I was a teenager, you know, 1999, right at the height of the dot-com boom. And uh, I was an only child. My parents both worked summer vacation. I was like at home on the computer, right? And um, I basically discovered Yahoo Finance portfolio yep. builder and I built my own portfolio and I was doing very, very well um, in part because it was 1999, everything was just going gangbusters. Uh, and so I had like Yahoo stock and all the companies that made products that I used or had heard of. And that's how I learned to invest. And I remember my parents were like very uh, encouraging of this hobby. They're like, wow, this is you actually. Did, did your parents understand the markets? Did they know what the stock market was and in investing? They, they knew in principle, but they had also never invested before. Right. I mean, they were kind of discovering it at the same time because we had immigrated from Bulgaria, which didn't really have a functional stock market. Right. And, you know, um, for a while, they didn't have very much money and investing wasn't accessible to people without a ton of money. So it was sort of 1996 when my parents started working and we kind of discovered it at the same time. So I remember my dad created an E-Trade account with me. It was a custodial account, put some money in it, let me manage it because I was doing so well uh, with my simulated portfolio. <laughs> and I bought this company, 3Com. I don't know if you've heard of yep. 3Com, but uh, they made the original Palm Pilot, and um, I had the same experience as you. I owned the 3Com shares. Uh, I was like tracking the price, but then I started getting the proxy materials and the shareholder communications, now and I really care. felt like an owner. Right. And then it went through uh, a company spinoff, so it spun off Palm, and now I had two stocks, and my money <laughs> like increased i think it close to doubled so then i learned what a spin-off is and how all these corporate actions work and i think that really began my lifelong journey and interest in investing that continues to this day so my parents are from india they immigrated here as well they had no idea what the stock market was wasn't what investing was they were busy trying to you know put a roof over me and my sister's heads and and because of your product i'm now gaining the financial in literacy to educate them about the markets. My mom yep. opened up her Roth IRA for the first time at 53. And it was an emotional experience when she put money in and she realized like she had something that she was really saving and building. Do you also think my generation getting access to the markets is helping educate our parents' generation that just didn't know about it? I used to say this a lot uh, in kind of the early days of Robinhood because um, I think Robinhood might be one of the first financial products that actually gets shared from child to parent yes. rather than parent to child. Yep. Because um, it is just as much, if not more so, a technology product. And younger people tend to be early adopters of technology. They're using new apps, new interfaces. And since financial services and technology, I mean, fintech's like a relatively new thing, mm -hmm. you can kind of look at the word fintech on Google Trends, 
and it's very much sort of in line with Robinhood, right? FinTech wasn't really a thing when we, when we got started. People didn't know what to call us. And so Robinhood, I think, became one of the first products that kids would actually share with their parents. And it kind of goes up a generation rather than being handed down and, you know, you using your, your you know, your parents' wealth manager yeah. or their advisor. Um, and I think that that was a powerful thing. A lot of people uh, learn about Robinhood through their kids. Okay, so tell me how... How, how you brought this idea to life. There's probably a lot of uh, entrepreneurs listening, people that want to build startups. I mean, Robinhood at one point was an idea. Like, like yeah. it was in your head. Today it is a public company that's listed on the stock exchange. I mean, like that is just a, it, it, is, it is a rock star thing to do, but to get there, you have to do a lot of stuff. I, Jason Calcanis gave you a check, angel investors. How did you actually start and then eventually bring this to, to get to the public markets? It took a long time. And actually, my co-founder and I, we uh, started a previous company in New York, which was an algorithmic training business. So uh, very different than Robinhood. The customers were extremely sophisticated institutional investors. And the trading platform was an API based trading platform where the value prop was the lowest latency in the industry. Wow. So we had a, a trading platform and we were competing on latency. It was uh, the metrics was tick to trade latency. So you get a market data tick coming in and our platform kind of takes that market data, consolidates it, hands it back to the strategy and then receives the order and sends it out to the exchange. How old were you when you started that? I was uh, 2009, so I would have been 22. Wow. 22. And um, yeah, this was measured in microseconds at the time. So the, the lowest latency platforms had a tick to trade of single digit microseconds. And what we realized was um, basically our customers were placing billions of dollars of volume per day. They were trading, you know, millions of times a day. And the cost of doing that was basically nothing. I right. mean, it was there was a fixed cost in managing the platform, but with like three or four people, you could manage that activity since we were automating the lion's share of it. And then uh, I moved to San Francisco to start our West Coast development office. And um, I was at a party actually in San Francisco where I was explaining to some of the people there, you know, we have this business, mm -hmm. we're helping institutional investors, we have this low latency software, we place millions of trades a day for essentially no cost. And this guy was like, oh, wait a minute, um, you're telling me you can place millions of trades a day at no cost. Why am I, I'm paying $15 right. per trade in my Schwab account. Right. Like, why can't I use your software? And at first I was like, no, that's ridiculous. You have to be really sophisticated to use my software. You basically need to be a software engineer and you're coding up these strategies. But then we got to thinking why are people paying $15 a trade? Like that doesn't make any sense. Can we use the same technology and the same infrastructure and really the same idea to take the advances that electronic trading made on the institutional side right. and give it to retail? And my co-founder and I also were just, you know, this was around the time that Steve Jobs launched the iPhone and the iPad. That's like our coming of age time Right. And so we, we always just wanted to launch a consumer product that could touch millions of people. That was very attractive to us. So once we start, sort of like got into this idea and started thinking about it, it became all consuming. And we sort of like pivoted all of our energy towards launching this consumer product. Who was the first check into the company? Um, there, were, there were a few people. So we raised on convertible notes. Right. Um, and there were a few people that came in the initial round, which were um, sort of contacts that we had made through our previous business from the algorithmic trading industry. So Michael Rauchman, who was the CTO of GetGo, mm. Dave Babalek, who was a former GetGo person as well. Um, and GetGo, um, not a lot of people remember it but it was sort of like the market leader in algorithmic trading. They really pushed the markets towards um, being electronic and were the leading market maker, 
know, in the right. 15 years ago. So those guys came in. Google Ventures. We were, I think, one of the first Google Ventures checks. Yep. Um, I still remember getting that. They invested two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and Google had actually rejected me uh, <laughs> when I applied to be. I don't remember if it was a software engineer or a data scientist. So a couple of years later, Google Ventures backing my company. Um, I remember when I got the call from our partner there, I was like, I, you know, you have to be like very stoic and not show emotion when an investor is telling you that they want to invest money right. in your company right. because you don't want to seem too eager yep. and they can negotiate and get a better price. But I literally dropped the phone and you could kind of hear me telling Beiju and the early team that was assembled in the Palo Alto garage space. And um, yeah, we were very excited to get to get that first investment. So 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 when you raised that first seed round, uh, obviously the company started doing well and grew. And I think 2014, 2015, you launched. Um, when you launched, you guys had some massive growth. I mean, yeah. growth that is unheard of. And most companies in the public markets don't even really grow. A lot of startups, they grow, but then they end up failing, right? 99% of startups fail. You guys hyperscaled. And so my question here is for the, for the entrepreneurs, the startups that are listening, what was that process like when you have 10,000 users go to a million users in like a few months? How did you guys manage the day-to-day -day of actually scaling in the early yeah. days? Um, I think that the, the really interesting thing was that we uh, had tried a bunch of things up until the point that we launched the initial Robinhood waitlist that weren't very successful. I was talking to you earlier about the analyst app mm -hmm. where everyone could be a crowdsourced stock analyst. I mean, we had a hard time uh, growing monthly active users there. Maybe it got to like the hundreds of monthly active users and we had to like, like uh, scratch and claw our way to keeping those users engaged. Right. And so when we launched the Robinhood waitlist and you know went viral on Hacker News and on Reddit, the last thing that we were expecting was that we would have this viral product announcement with you know tens, hundreds of thousands of people lining up because we had just never experienced that. And then I think um, we, we just had wind at our backs since that initial announcement. And to a large extent, up until a couple of years ago, we were just sort of like capturing that and right. evolving and it, it to its to its conclusion. So by Series D, I think you guys are already a multi-billion dollar company. How did that feel, knowing you have a multi-billion dollar startup bef before you go public? Like, like, what was your mental state at that time? I remember when we were in uh, New York working out of an apartment and we were just sitting and talking about how big our business could be right and we were like man can you imagine if this company could be 25 million dollars like that would be insane right that that seemed crazy to us um but then you kind of get on with uh building the business right and we had a million people on the wait list and uh, a million people on the wait list um allowed us to get a series A and our first series A was, I think uh, we raised $13 million at a valuation of 70 million. And I remember a few of my friends wanted to invest in the company at that point. And I was like, man, I don't know, $70 million series <laughs> A. I really, um, I thought to myself, okay, in the seed, I would take some of my friend's money because these are small checks and worst case scenario, I could pay them back right. the money, right? right. And, and the friendship, uh, yeah, the, Might the friendship intact. would probably yeah. be intact. But, you know, then we started getting to $70 million valuation. I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I really don't want to get ahead of the skis. This valuation might be a little high. Um, and then, of course, you work really hard to take the next step and you know it takes a couple of doublings and triplings you get into some big numbers but i think i think people adapt to the circumstances right so it's sort of like fun for a day you celebrate it and then you're kind of thinking about what's next back to work so it's yeah. it's a little bit i really have to remind myself that it is a, a pretty magical journey and i i do have to kind of reflect on it but i think my tendency is just to 
okay, now the expectations are this, I have to exceed those. And pretty much you get to the, you get to these big numbers and it's like, how can we become even bigger. the biggest financial company in the world? Like, can we think even bigger? And I think we've been around 10 years. It's, it's pretty crazy to imagine, but um, the mission wasn't so expansive in the past, right? It was just about launching no a really cool app that allows people to trade commission free on mobile. Right. Um, we didn't really talk about democratizing all of finance for everyone in the world, but um, customers wanting more from us, us sort of like getting more practice and learning and building up the scar tissue from all the mistakes that we've made and all the products that we launched that didn't really work out very well. Um, the ambition grows and now we just feel confident we can do much more. Well, I mean, in terms of doing much more, you guys just had an event. Uh, thank you for the invite last night. I got to attend the event. Yeah. Um, there's Glad a to lot to talk about in this event. The part that blew me away and dropped my jaw to the floor, and I think a lot of people have told me the same, is you guys are giving a 1% match on every dollar that is deposited on Robinhood. Now, you started this 1% brokerage transfer match uh, about a few months ago, and I thought it was pretty genius because I have some pretty high net worth friends that use Schwab and Fidelity, and they took all of their money, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars, and brought it onto Robinhood, and you bring a million bucks, you get $10,000 for basically just switching to a different platform. It was a genius idea. And then when you guys ended it, I was like, all right, so that was great. They got some customers. I don't know if that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now you're doing it unlimited to everyone. The biggest question I got yesterday when I talked about this on Twitter was, okay, we've seen a lot of companies promise you know, to give 1% APY. These companies end up going bankrupt. They lose all their money. There's court cases. So how do you guys afford to do this? What are the unit economics on making this real? Yeah, so uh, first of all, we're very scientific about all of these decisions. So we, we don't make investments whether they be marketing investments or products without uh, there being like firm data backing it. And of course, sometimes we'll take a leap of faith and experiment. But if, if you think about the history of how uh, the deposit match, which has really become a much bigger thing than when we initially launched it, if you think about the history, it started off as a 1% uh, IRA match Correct. for the retirement accounts yep. just on contributions, right? Right. And the thesis was pretty simple. The thesis was, let's say you look at Robinhood's revenue in, over the past 12 months, a little bit under $2 billion, depending on how you compute it, and assets under custody, give or take $100 billion, yep. right? So if, if you look at revenue yield, so revenue over assets un under custody, it's it's roughly 2%. Correct. So 2% of the assets turn into revenue for the business on an annual basis. And that number has been, there's been a little bit of fluctuation here and there, but it's been pretty consistent over time. You know, it was right around 2% in 2020 and right. 2021 as we had large uh, asset growth on the platform. So um, the calculation would make sense if, if we're generating 2% in uh, revenue yield on assets, giving 1% for retirement contributions, um, theoretically should have worked the out. The math works. Particularly math works. if those retirement assets are incremental. So there's a lot of unknowns. Um, how incremental are they? Are people just gonna take money that they would have deposited in their taxable account anyway and move it into retirement? Right. Um, obviously, if that happens, uh, it's it, it could affect the economics. Is the mix shift of activity going to be different? And what we found was, you know, when we rolled it out, the economics and the asset growth, uh, to some extent, exceeded our expectations of of the program. And so then we introduced the one percent match on a cats mm -hmm. and rollovers, and then we we thought to ourselves. Um, and, and actually, I was a big proponent. I We've been thinking about how to grow gold for quite some time. Right. Um, the decision from that point on, once we had the early data from the 1% contribution match, to do 3% on rollovers and uh, contributions into IRAs was pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, th this was really exciting to me because uh, from my understanding, 
Robinhood did achieve gap profitability uh, last quarter. And if yep. you guys wanted to do 1% for uh, deposits going in forward, my thought, my first thought was, well, they've done the math on this. If they were already profitable on doing this before, there's a chance they think they can retain that profitability because the unit economics and math makes sense. And as you said, if the yield you're getting, because so many people are putting so much money onto the platform, maybe there's a way they can actually make this work. Um, do you think the 1% deposit match means that if you're using another broker, you're really missing out? Uh, yeah, um, I do think so. I mean, if you think about how, um, and th they do this math in the Boglehead forums, because us giving you a deposit match is akin to a higher return on the assets that you're investing in. Right? Or even a so, raise for your salary. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so just economically, it's a valuable proposition, even for folks that, especially for folks that are engaging in this kind of lazy boglehead, set it and forget it type of investing. Right. And I think that's why uh, if you look at the forums that last night's announcement was kind of going viral in, I mean, it was nice discussion in r slash bogleheads where they're like, okay, now they have the IRA match, deposit <laughs> match on ACH transfers, deposits in the platform. Tell me, you know, how it makes sense to not have my ETFs just stored on this platform, on all of my ETFs. And, you know, I think that there's some wood to chop to earn back some of the trust that we admittedly lost through the meme stock stuff. And some people just they have a bad impression of Robin Hood and from both sides, both because of us having to restrict trading because of the, the capital requirements and also because people just associate Robin Hood right. with meme stocks. Correct. They say, OK, you guys enabled that activity that we just don't find very, you know, long term oriented. Um, but I think over time, the product experience, the economics, the fact that we're actually diversifying and offering all of these long term passive products has done quite a bit to change the brand and shift it over to one where you can imagine your very serious retirement money uh, being safe at Robinhood and it being a, a great proposition for you to keep it there. Let's talk about that. This morning, you said that it took you guys 12 months about 12 months to go from zero to 1.5 billion in retirement uh, assets under management. In under 90 days, you've gone from 1.5 billion, today you revealed to 4 billion. That to me does not sound like a meme stock trading app. That to me sounds like people that are trusting their financial future with you guys. I mean, can you speak on where do you think the future of retirement is going and how that's gonna generate you know, more substantial revenues ultimately for the business? I think the the thing about retirement is it, it's long term money that's sticky. Customers are retiring for decades. They choose their IRA provider uh, with the intent of kind of growing that nest egg bigger and bigger and bigger over time, and you know rarely, if ever, withdrawing from it. Um, so, and you know, if you look at the overall individual retirement account market, it it holds the bulk of the assets, yep. right? There's 14 trillion, yep. give or take, in individual retirement accounts uh, in the US, much bigger than 401ks. And close to a trillion gets rolled over every single year from employer-sponsored 401k plans into IRAs. Correct. It's in the high hundreds of billions. So, I mean, we're, we're proud of the progress that we've made, but there's a lot more wood to chop before those trillions in assets make their way to Robinhood, which excites me because there's just lots more to do. We're gonna make the product better and better. Um, we hope to see the acceleration and asset growth continuing. We've been pretty happy so far, but um, there's a lot more to do. And the roadmap that that team has is just chock full. There's just so many things that we have left to build there to make the product even better. Right, and I think it goes back down to product because uh, I maxed out my Roth IRA on Robinhood for 7,000 this year. And I was gonna do like, you know, 100 a week, 200 a week, and then it's just, it's in the middle of the app 
I always press it and it says, yeah. hey, you got 5,000 left. You, why don't you just, and I was just like, all right, there you go. And so I think the product itself incentivizes you to save for retirement, which is the literal opposite of what some of people are, you know, are accusing the product of being in terms of meme stocks. And so I think it's a really, really good decision. 5% APY. I understand uh, the business model because I've studied the company pretty extensively of how you can afford to give people a 5% APY and still make money. Yeah. For those that are listening that have no clue how Robinhood gets you 5% on your money, Maybe they know a little bit about interest rates, but how do you guys afford that as well? Yeah, I mean, that one's pretty straightforward because we actually collect the spread from the partner banks. Partner banks give us a rebate because they're capable of generating even higher yield. So I think the number is like 560 or 570 on average. Right. So um, it is a profitable business for us. We, we pass back the majority of the yield to customers. And there there was sort of a promo where some customers would even get five and a quarter. Yep. Um, but yeah, on, on every dollar that's deposited, we actually do make uh, a small fee that gets and passed that adds along up over directly time. from, from the, the partner banks. Right. So you use a network of partner banks and then you're able to pass most of the unique economics onto the customer. Um, X1. All right. So you guys unveiled a credit card, 3% cash back. Uh, before we get into the actual card, how did this acquisition go down? Like, I want to know the behind the scenes. Did you call these guys? Did you send them a DM and like, hey, I want to buy your company for 100 million bucks? Well, so we had been, uh, we had talked to them uh, through the years. We saw that they launched a wait list for the X1 card and it was very well done. I don't know if you've played around with the original X1 card. I was a customer mm. of X1. It was my primary credit card for for some time. Oh, uh, so you used this product before you guys bought the company? Like, I used the product, yeah. Um, and they had this really awesome, like they care about design and user experience. They had this awesome uh, animation on the home screen of their website where you could see the card dropping and they recorded the sound of the of the metal card dropping and you could just replay it over and over again. Um, so it was very well done and they'd raised a whole bunch of money about a year. I guess it was, it was about a year ago now. Uh, we had the banking crisis. Right. We forget about this, but a whole bunch of banks went belly up. Right. Um, Silicon Valley Bank, massive behemoth, Signature Bank, um, Credit Suisse. Yeah. 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 And it the credit markets contracted, and they had a hard time growing the business in in that environment. And so uh, we were very fortunate to be able to partner with them at the time where. You know, they needed access to the sort of balance sheet and capital and resources to grow their business that Robinhood could offer. And, you know, I've been very passionate about credit cards for quite some time. Mm. I've been thinking about building a credit card for many years. And I think that when I started talking to Deepak and Sid and we were really thinking about what we could build, it became clear that these guys want to build an awesome credit card. They want to leave footprints in the world too and and build something that people talk about and millions of people use. Right. And I think uh, we both realized that if we did that together, we had a path to doing that relatively quickly. Like it, it wouldn't take years. Right. It actually especially with Robin it's, one year. Especially with your distribution already. Yeah. The, the reason I asked that question is because I, I think some people think, oh, they just launched the credit card to launch it. It seems like you've been doing research now. You were a user of X1 for years before you bought the company. And you guys have been thinking about the credit markets, which people in finance know is one of the most profitable business in the financial sector. Um, and so that's how you came up with the idea. 3% cash back. Biggest question I got yesterday. Everyone loved the idea. But credit cards are pretty risky. There's a lot of delinquencies, defaults. How are you guys philosophically thinking about mitigating credit risk? I think we tend to be pretty conservative when it, when it comes to these things. Um, and I mean, the, one of the other reasons why we really got excited about, about uh, acquiring X1 is they built an awesome credit team. Uh, Diego Cerruti, who's chief credit officer, uh, led credit at Nubank. Mm. And you know, new bank, um, very impressive company. 
I mean, they've really redefined uh, credit in emerging markets. Yep. And a lot of that philosophy and kind of how we how we think about credit, um, I think Diego and, and his credit team brought to Robinhood. And so um, we bring a lot of that experience and the DNA. And we're also planning on rolling this out prudently. So we're not going to be rash about it, but we're right. pretty confident that the economics are going to work out for this business on a standalone basis, not even um, taking into account the gold ecosystem effects. And the innovation here for the card is you don't look at credit score, you look at income. Well, we, we look at a variety of things, income being one of them. Um, and I, I think it's really lots of innovations, several innovations at once. Um, I think it's pretty unique that this type of premium card can be uh, accessible to lots of people. I mean, premium credit cards like this typically accept less than half of their applicants. Correct. We're saying all you have to do is be a gold member. And we'll, we'll get this card to you. And, you know, that requires a lot of work on the back end by the credit team. Um, it also, I think, sets us up very well to make this not just a great credit card for people that are transacting and paying off their balance in full. I think those people will use it. it makes a lot of sense. Yep. But um, it, it, it's going to be a great card for people that are building credit and starting their journey with credit uh, in the early days as well. So imagine if you're a college student or you know you're an immigrant at a really good university. And I ran into this all the time when I was at Stanford or UCLA, like very, very smart people with very clear uh, earning potential. And you, you know that their cash flow is going to be strong. Right. We're not qualifying for credit cards because they didn't have the credit history. And so then you get these um, starter credit builder cards that are really not very good. Like. Most of them don't even offer any rewards Most of them for suck. cash back. They suck. They're plastic. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then you use this starter card to build your credit, and hopefully in two or three years you can qualify for the nicer card. Um, yeah, and we thought, can we make a starter card that actually gives you 3% rewards and helps you build credit? And I think um, we realized that that's actually a really powerful thing. So I don't think it's just going to be used by people that are transacting and paying their balance in full, but it'll be a great tool for credit building right. for the whole family. And that's what got us excited. And that's actually pretty innovative as well. So it's not just the rewards, not the design, not the digital experience, but the fact that we're making this one singular card that um, can serve a wide variety of, of customers. And to access that, I mean, this is laughable. It is five dollars a month. Well, like, you have to pay for the annual fee or the annual gold plan. Um, <laughs> but yes, it's incredibly inexpensive. And, uh, and do you guys plan to keep this at this cheap of a rate just to get market share? Is that the idea there? Well, I I wouldn't say that. I'm gonna. Um, we we do uh, occasionally test pricing, and we try to understand like what pricing makes sense. Right. Um, and we have debates about this. I mean, internally at Robinhood, really smart people were debating all the time. They're like, this is crazy. People would pay $50 a month yep. for these types of features yep. and, and this type of functionality. We could raise the price. And my, my tendency is to generally like be very protective about the price because um, I really love one of, one of the best business stories to me is how uh, the Costco founder, uh, Jim Senegal, um, price of a hot dog at Costco has been a, a buck 50 since the early eighties. Right. And yep. ever since, uh, anytime anyone even like threatens or suggests, uh, raising the price of that hot dog, Jim Senegal is like, I'm going to kill you if you, if you, uh, even talk about getting that price above 150. You right. Know? I think that creates a culture where that subscription is is amazing. I mean, we learn a lot from Costco and Amazon Prime and these great companies that have built these great subscription businesses where you just have uh, an expectation and a loyalty to the brand that 
you kind of know you're getting an awesome deal. Right. And maybe in some cases you get better deals for individual products. But by and large, I think customers have this expectation that if Costco has a product in their warehouse, being a member gives you that peace of mind that you're getting an unbelievable deal and the experience is quite good. And that's how, you know, I still shop at Costco. A lot of my friends, regardless of their income, you could be, you know, very, very wealthy person. You're still going to Costco. You could be someone that is actually, you know, in need of buying things in bulk and and not be as wealthy. It's still valuable for you. I have said for the past couple of years, Robin Hood's moat lies in UI and user experience. And I've had debates with friends who say, that's not a moat. Are you kidding? Like that can be copied. And I'm like, yeah, that could be copied. A product can be copied. Yeah. A product experience is very difficult to copy. Do you think one of the moats of Robinhood is that product focus experience that you have for the end customer? I've been surprised, frankly, that the user experience hasn't been copied better. Mm. I mean, it's sort of like, wow. Uh, and I don't know exactly why that's the case. It's sort of like they copy it halfway. Yeah. The app kind of looks like Robin Hood, but then it's just really slow. And sometimes they have kind of web views for some of the screens. Um, I, I don't think it's just the user experience. Um, I think that if if you look at the things that we've had that have taken a while to, to replicate, um, a lot of it is business model innovations where we're kind of, it, it's sort of like innovators dilemma in a sense, like classical disruption. Um, we start by offering something at a lower margin than competitors are offering. And at first, competitors are kind of resistant to it. Because think about free trading as an example. And I think this goes, uh, this example also applies to the IRA matches and yeah. all those products. But for free trading, if you're an incumbent brokerage, like let's say, you know, TD Ameritrade, since they don't exist anymore, right? Uh, or Scott Trade. Um, so when Robinhood came along and, um, the, and we came and we started offering free trades and they were offering 995 trades, the initial reaction was, um, we don't want that customer that customer is going to be unprofitable for us. Uh, it's all new customers with no money that are signing up for Robinhood. Yep. And what they were afraid of, why they couldn't match the economics, was because they were worried about all the existing customers that were trading. So you can't actually offer free trades to new customers and keep charging your existing customers nine ninety five. They would get incredibly upset about that, right. and they would demand that same pricing. So what they're seeing is a large existing customer base with a very large amount of revenue. Uh, the prospect of that going to zero is unpalatable. I mean, these are public companies, and you justify that by saying our customers really appreciate the service. We have a lot of them. They don't seem like they're leaving for Robin Hood, mm -hmm. they seem pretty happy, even though they're probably leaving at a slow rate that compounds over time. And then, you know, after five years, we were getting 70% industry download share and, you know, all sorts of trading market share. And it became so big and threatening that they had no choice but to respond, right? right. But by then it was too late. We couldn't be, we, we had already gotten to the point where we were large enough that, um, we had a sustainable business. IRA match is similar. Um, you know, it's very painful for a broker that has seven trillion in client assets to face the prospect of paying one percent on that seven trillion to keep those assets there. That's why you think Schwab and Fidelity can't as easily do the one percent match. It's very difficult for them because once it gets out that you know Schwab is paying you one percent to keep your portfolio there. Yeah, I mean, that type of news travels fast. Yeah, right. Um, so I, I think that's going to be difficult for them, and they're going to be reluctant to do it. And they might do it in lighter ways here and there. Um, but yeah, I think it's disruption in the classical sense. And then I think there's uh, ultimately this. This all comes down to technology and engineering, because 
how are we able to offer lower prices or much more efficient where operating a fixed cost technology business with no brick and mortar branch office locations, very little overhead. Right. Um, and, you know, the things that are really difficult to copy are fundamental technology innovations. For example, the clearing system that we built from scratch, from the ground up, not a lot of people talk about it, but that allowed us to vertically integrate our entire stack on the brokerage side. Clearing and, means someone puts, puts a trade and you guys actually execute for them. Well, we execute the trade through market makers, but clearing is basically all of the post-trade stuff. Uh -huh. So that trade gets executed and eventually the shares have to move. They right. have to be you know, custodied or we custody them themselves. Right. And of course there's T plus two settlement. So we have to coordinate with the central clearing house and move the shares. All of this stuff that is automated in crypto with blockchains, we kind of do uh, with our clearing system. And so you guys vertically integrated that in a way that actually saved costs, essentially. Yeah, yeah. because clearing firms that offer a service, um, like the Apexes, for example, uh, they have to generate revenue too. So they're taking a percentage of the cash interest. They're taking a percentage of the stock lending revenue. And since we do that in-house, that allows us to keep most of the economics. And then 24-hour market is another example. Yeah, so you tweeted That's a chart. To... You tweeted a chart the other day. I mean, I look. So you can look at Robinhood uh, underneath the ticker in the 24-hour markets and see the volume of how many people have traded a certain stock. And some of these stocks I go to, there's like 100,000 shares traded from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. And it's. It, it, what is the philosophy there? And is that also just great for growth? Because like your business hours were from nine to 4.30 or 9.30 yeah. to four. And now you have 24 hours to theoretically make payment for order flow revenue. Yeah, well actually our margins on the uh, extended hours uh, are lower than core hours. The reason we really did it was I mean, we wanted to do it from the very beginning when we sat down and sketched out what the ideal equities trading experience would be. Uh, fractionalization was a part of it. 24-7 was actually the goal. I don't think markets should ever close. Right. Uh, I think we have to kind of jettison the last vestiges of East Coast, New York working hours because everything's electronic anyway. Um, so we just knew we had to get there. We knew that this was a big part of it. And... It, it almost, you know, uh, the, the, the goal with it is this should be a big differentiator for people use, using Robinhood. You should feel like, I mean, you, you actually are at a disadvantage if you can manage your risk 24-7. 24-7, yeah. And, you know, your platform doesn't offer that, but Robinhood does. Because if you think about it, let's say something happens, you want to close your position, manage your risk your assets are at risk at a broker that only has limited market access. So our, our thought was, you know, if this, this is a big differentiator. It's a technology innovation. It's clearly not straightforward to copy because it's been out for about a year and it hasn't really been copied yet because right. it's actually hard. It's not like changing pricing. Um, and I think as we add more and more of these, the technology moat becomes bigger. I mean, Clearing, I think, does create a sustainable competitive dif advantage for us. 24-hour market, that infrastructure, um, the card business. I mean, we we actually, not just through X1, but through operating a debit card business and making sure that our money movement rails um, are, and our fraud controls and all of that infrastructure is robust. It's been battle-tested, right? Because right. we've... Um, we launched this product, Robinhood Instant, which now is standard. We, uh, a lot of companies have replicated parts of it, but um, what that does is that gives you instant access to your cash, even though there is some risk of a customer stopping that bank transfer. Right. It takes several days. Um, there's also, you know, with crypto transfers, you have to have really buttoned up risk and fraud controls because once someone transfers crypto out, it's gone. It's gone. Right. There's no calling up your counterparty and reversing it like you can do with the traditional financial system. So the more products and the greater surface area we built there, the more pressure uh, put on 
our risk and fraud infrastructure. And in order to offer the low prices sustainably over time, like our our solutions there and the technology have to be really, really good. And then that accrues and is amortized over every future product that involves money movement, right? which tends to be the majority of them. The majority of the economics of these products are really affected by how effectively you can minimize fraud losses and, and right. reduce friction. January 2021, this was a wild time for you as a human being. You were on every TV show on the planet uh, and obviously a wild time for the company. After everything that has happened, I still see, I would say, 3% out of the 97% of positivity people have towards Robinhood. There's 3% that have a negative affinity for the brand. And the things they say is, I will never use this product. I don't trust Robinhood. And there is nothing they can do to get me back. What they did was horrible. I just, I can't, I can't deal with them. Pe those people are going to be watching this. What is your response to those people in terms of how they thought of what happened and what you're going to do to try to get them onto the platform? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I completely understand why people would have this impression that, you know, we were colluding with hedge funds and market makers uh, and, you know, holding down the the trading. Um, I mean, I, I was kind of following this this whole story as an observer before Robin Hood was very much in, in the middle with the trading <laughs> restrictions. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you kind of have to think about my motivations as a business person, not just a, a human that loves trading and free access to markets, um, of course, if it was possible to allow people to trade unrestricted, um, that's what I would have wanted to do. I mean, everything about the, the Robinhood brand and our business model and the revenues and how much our customers use us and care about us, the bedrock of that is customers trusting us and, and our intentions. So I think it was really unfortunate that we weren't able to communicate as effectively as we could have to kind of stop the misinformation narrative right. around the collusion. And right. I think it still pervades to this day. People are just convinced that, you know, we were colluding with hedge funds to somehow suppress this. Certain thing. movies don't really help to change yeah, the narrative. <laughs> right. Uh, they kind of allude to it. Um, right. Um, yeah. And I, I, I do replay that and think, okay, like, could I have said some magic words or communicated a little bit better so that we could clearly articulate uh, what was going on. So what and, would you say to those people to come back to the platform? I mean, I, th I think that also the unfortunate thing is since so much of this was made possible by Robinhood and Robinhood was kind of the platform that everyone was downloading, even though other brokers did the same exact Correct. thing because they had the, the same issues, we sort of got the the lion's share of the attention, um, and I think that's kind of the price of market leadership to extent to a, to a certain extent. You're kind of the uh, Robinhood became sort of like the personification of the failure of U.S. equities markets to uh, to work right. that day, even though it was bigger than Robinhood. Um, what I'd say is uh, hopefully. The, the real story of what exactly happened and the fact that it was a collateral issue is a little bit complicated to understand. And I can understand why people wouldn't want to get into the details behind it. But um, I, I think that could be better explained to, uh, to customers. And other than that, what I'm focusing on is making the service as reliable as possible. The balance sheet has been strengthened, which will hopefully give customers the uh, the comfort that if we were in a similar scenario with uh, high volatility in in stocks that we would handle it much better and uh, otherwise just keep shipping amazing products and let the value speak for itself yeah. if we keep improving the user experience giving people more value then you know eventually i think they'll they'll start to understand that and more mileage and, and more time spent um, making progress and kind of uh, building this company and, and showing success across all environments and through multiple years, I think will, will also help 
alleviate some of the customers' concerns there? Yeah, I think that's the answer. I think the, the product got the product announcement you guys did yesterday, keep shipping. Like to me, at the end of the day, people's memories, they're fickle eventually. And when they have a product that's just so amazing, at some point they're gonna, you know, have to realize, well, maybe I should actually get one percent on every freaking dollar that I put onto this platform. Um, I wanna do like four or five rapid fire questions, so thirty seconds to a minute in your answers. Sure. Uh, crypto, just how do you philosophically think about the concept of cryptocurrencies? I think it's very powerful. You know, it has the potential to completely reorganize how the financial system works. We talked a little bit about settlement. The cost of settlement on a crypto public blockchain is close to zero. The cost of creating trading infrastructure drops close to zero. Right. So I think um, very much in line with our approach of using technology to lower costs for investors. I do think there needs to be more integration between the traditional financial assets that people find valuable and the world of crypto and the infrastructure. And I think Robinhood can play a role in in making that happen. Uh, the UK launch, how is that going? I know some customers are saying there's no ISA, there's no margins, there's no options yet. Uh, do you guys think that can be a really big market for you as you bring more of those features? I think one of the things that when we look at the UK launch that's got us very excited is that these customers resemble Robinhood customers in the US. So if you if you look at the behavior, it's it's pretty similar. And as we talk to UK customers, they want things that we have in the US. <coughs> so I think international expansion, the, the thesis behind it at Robinhood is the core platform can be used to extend and expand internationally with minimal customization. And the customization that we need is around the edges. Right. Like, you know, instead of a 3% IRA match, maybe we do a 3% ISA match Correct. with gold, right? Yeah. But it's really around the edges and with things like tax wrappers. And the fact that customers want options, they're asking for crypto, they want an ISA's, ISA with a great match, they love a 24-hour market, and they love the 5% AER on cash. Um, I think those are all really positive things that tell us if we just roll out the products that we currently have in the U.S., into the UK, which is mostly a regulatory process of getting the right licenses, then we'll be in good shape. And then there's platform level things that we know customers are asking us for that actually benefit the US and every other country. Right. Those are like multi-currency wallets. So you can hold your pounds and your dollars in one account. It's gonna be useful for US customers too because they like to trade currencies and hold different currencies. And so, um, there's a lot of wood to chop in the UK, but we if really that, if, love what we're seeing. If that goes well, is Canada on the, I mean, like, are, you don't have to say specific countries, but is the rest of the world? Because I have a lot of people saying, when is Robinhood coming to Singapore, Asia, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this year we're focused on two things. One is rounding out the product suite so that we deliver all these things that customers are asking for, but also expanding to new jurisdictions. And we've kind of built the machinery already to expand. And the cost of getting into a, incremental jurisdiction is going to be much lower than what it took us to get to the UK. What's your favorite book? Ooh, uh, I try to read a lot. I like, um, uh, I like math books. Yeah, I still read <laughs> math books. Uh, you still read math books? Like I do. Proofs yeah. and, and shit like that? Like proofs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All sometimes right. I like pick up my old college textbooks or my grad school textbooks. Um, okay. I, I really it. like um, the book that comes to mind. I recommended it to someone recently. It's a book about the uh, double slit experiment. Have you heard about I'm not, this? I've not. It's called, uh, I think it's like through, through two doors at once. It's about the fundamental uh, sort of paradox in quantum mechanics which is the double, it's, it's, it's sort of a very easy experiment to run, but it's the double slit experiment, which is you basically have a, a, a wall or a screen with two holes in it, and you're shooting uh, electrons through it, and then you can kind of see, uh, do they make particle sort of pattern or waves? And uh, in some cases they make particle patterns, in some cases waves, and uh, it's just sort of like the big mystery of uh, quantum mechanics. How can these electrons go through both holes at the same time? So instead of Brave New World, this is, uh, this is what 
you like to read. I love it. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Of all time? Yeah. I know it's Dumb Money, but what's your actual favorite movie? <laughs> um, I have so many, but if I had to pick one that I kind of come back to time and time again, I'd probably go with Back to the Future. Okay. That's a good one. That's a good one. Great Broadway musical, too. Last two questions. Uh, what or who is a public CEO currently that you admire and look up to? I mean, I think it's it's a little bit trite, but I've been saying it for 10 years. Uh, every time I get this question, I pretty much say Elon Musk. Wow. Yeah. What Was it surreal when you guys were on Clubhouse together? Talking? It was. Yeah, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last question for you, Vlad. Thank you for giving me your time today. I know you're a really busy person. Uh, Robinhood, to me, is one of the only companies on the planet that is living up to a financial mission that they're putting out there. You guys want to democratize finance. And the event I saw last night, what you guys have done over the past five years, someone like me, whose family knows not much about investing, and I have now been given access to the capital markets because of your platform, you've democratized finance for me. What is motivating you every day to keep building Robinhood? I mean, I think that to me, uh, democratizing finance is a very lofty goal and we're nowhere close to it, right? I think that... You think you're nowhere close at all? No, very, very early in that journey. Um, first of all, we're still, we've still taken our first steps outside of the U.S. We're pretty much still a very, very U.S. company. Um, there's all sorts of products and services that are left to build. I mean, we're just taking the first steps into credit, but there are all sorts of different credit lending products that customers need and we could help with um, wealth management. I mean, we're still self-directed platform, but we know there's a lot of customers that want a little bit more assistance and help in managing their investments, building their wealth. And I know that there's a lot of awesome products and services that I get access to because, you know, I've, I, I have the benefit of, you know, larger assets and more access to these things. And I'd like to give those to as many people as possible. So I think the roadmap is full for the next, I mean, multiple decades, as far as we can see. And there's a lot more innovations that we've got in the hopper that we haven't even talked about yet. Like every day, uh, it's just really motivating coming to work with these folks and they all really care about democratizing finance and it guides all of the decisions that we make. I think it's it's why people come to Robinhood by and large. We get people from the traditional financial industry who, you know, find it refreshing that we just we don't just care about making money and right. adding the bottom line. And we have engineers that, you know, they, they feel very directly. A lot of them are immigrants and they know how important money is. It's sort of like the number one topic that you're thinking about all the time as an immigrant and um you know they want to apply their engineering skills to to solving these problems so it's very exciting to me i think there's so much to do and i love building products i love talking to customers and i i think uh most of all i love working with this group of people super dedicated mission driven and uh they move incredibly fast which is also very exciting for me CEO and co-founder of Robin at Vlad. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I actually have something for you. Oh, um, uh oh. I heard you were we got this asking live. about a, a uh -oh. gold card. What it <laughs> oh boy. So this is actually a solid gold piece of jewelry. Wow. So you, you can't actually uh spend on it, unfortunately, but it'll give you an idea and hopefully you can uh This is this is real gold, right? Hopefully here. you can you can have it as a little memento of the of the event and this conversation, and we can figure out. Uh, well, it, it can hold you over until you get a real one to spend on. <laughs> this means the world. Thank you so much, Vlad. Ladies and gentlemen, Vlad Tenev, CEO of Robinhood. Thank you.